morning. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Come on in and take a seat. I want to say hello to all of you. We've got a large group on Zoom. I do ask if you're on Zoom that you mute yourself um, because we are going to show a video from the same computer that the Zoom is on. And so if you to talk during that video, everyone in the room will be able to hear you over the loudspeaker. So if you don't mind muting, if you haven't already, that would be great. Thank you. Um, well, good morning. Good uh, to see everyone as we kick off our summer lecture series for 2000. You ready? We are back in a hot mode. Last year we were only online, but this year we've got uh, some people in person and then a lot of you online. Is, all right. Um, this summer we're going to be talking about um, our one of our newest uh, way to get this louder uh, focuses here at the church, and that's transforming the world. The way that we go out to make a difference and to work for justice and equity and inclusion in the world and the church right. and the way we're called to do that. And so this morning, we are fortunate to have Laura Martin with us. Um, Laura is the Director of Disaster Response and U.S. Partner Relations at the United Methodist Committee on Relief. She leads the Encore U.S. Disaster Response Team in supporting and empowering United Methodist annual conferences and their local response to emergency situations in the United States. She is a public health and nutrition expert, as well as a global leader in humanitarian aid. Previously, she worked for Save the Children in various roles until 2013, including as an aid worker managing emergency health and nutrition programs. Most recently, Martin was a humanitarian researcher and managed the Center for Humanitarian Emergencies at Emory University. She's a frequent lecturer at Emory and teaches at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention as well. Uh, she's also a member at North Decatur United Methodist Church, just down the street with uh, Reverend Patrick Paul Haber. Uh, he says she's headed there after this. Um, but we, um, for those of you, you all know, we, we, we look to Encore first when there are disasters and emergencies. Um, it's our denominational response to that. And, um, we love the way it works. And so we are excited to have you here to tell us a little more about what you do, what Encore does, how we can partner with you. So you'll join me in welcoming Laura Martin. Good, Good morning, everybody. You got me in my, in my own. <laughs> All right. Well, good morning, everybody here and then also online. Hello to also, I just have to push out to my Emory Eagles. Um, it is a pleasure to be on Emory's campus, which is essentially home for me. Um, and used to work for Emory as Brent shared. So it, it really is a pleasure to be here. I'm particularly delighted to be here this morning for two reasons. One, this is my first time being in church okay, in. since the pandemic started. And so I am just, excited to be in person and be in community um, with each of you. Um, and uh, also, I love talking about U.S. disaster response. This is a ministry area that um, I have been called to and my team has been called to by God. Um, and it is a great honor to be able to represent this work and be able to share a little bit with you all about it and how you can get involved, which is really what that partnership and that connectionalism is all about, is working together. So y'all are gonna hear first, as we move the slide forward, um, from Roland Fernandez, the General Secretary of UMCOR and uh, General Board of Colonial Ministries, our parent agency. Um, it is a video that was just presented to annual conference in Athens and to other conferences, of course, as they have their meetings in the next couple of weeks. So I'm going to step aside and turn my volume back off as y'all get a chance to see um, this video that sets the stage for us today. <laughs> In the book of Acts chapter 1, Jesus tells the disciples that through the power of the Holy Spirit, they will be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. Working on behalf of you, people of the United Methodist Church, global ministries witnesses God's love for the world through people, projects, and partnerships in more than 100 countries. We are deeply grateful for your faithful commitment and generous gifts. Global Ministries connects the church's mission through programs in four priority areas. 
visionary service, evangelism and church revitalization, global health and humanitarian relief and recovery, which includes the work of the United Methodist Committee on Relief, UNCOR. Called from all corners of the world, more than 250 missionaries and young adult global mission fellows serve in 60 countries in a range of roles in relief pastors, church planters, educators, health professionals, and social workers. Even during the coronavirus pandemic, new missionaries have been placed in faithful service. Over 150 communities bear witness to the evangelism of current mission initiatives in Vietnam, Laos, Mongolia, Honduras, and Central African Republic. In the United States, global ministry celebrates and strengthens the work of diverse faith communities and seeks to combat racism in both church and society. Methodism's long-standing commitment to global health has supplied nearly 200 health facilities in 26 countries with medicines and equipment, training support, and building repair in recent years. Our response to the COVID-19 pandemic has included both sheltering in love, addressing prevention and personal impact, and love beyond borders, an ecumenical effort to ensure the equitable distribution of vaccines. Ankur alleviates suffering to disaster response and the support of migrants and refugees. In affected communities around the world, Ankur is there for the long term, providing hope and healing. Some of these crises are the result of climate change. Global Ministries continues to focus on efforts that increase environmental sustainability and deepen care for God's creation. Through the Yamasu Agriculture Initiative in Africa, we partner with the Episcopal areas and their annual conferences to offer technical and financial assistance that fosters long term stability to increase farming production enhance food security, and generate sustainable income. Amkor's work since Russia invaded Ukraine has enabled the distribution of millions of dollars to assist displaced persons in Ukraine, as well as refugees in neighboring countries. Amkor seeks to maximize its impact by working with both Methodist and ecumenical partners to provide food, water, medicine, shelter, and transportation for those affected by war. As the mission and service agency of the United Methodist Church, Global Ministry seeks to serve as a faithful steward of the generous gifts made by church members, congregations, annual conferences, and other institutions. Gifts that enable God's mission around the world. The mission flows from God's abundant grace expressed in Jesus Christ. to be exactly what Roland shared, a steward of the U.S. Disaster Response Program. UMCOR is the humanitarian and development agency of the United Methodist Church. Um, Brent, you're going to have to move me forward just a little bit with this slide. Um, we are the Committee on Relief. The humanitarian and development arm of the United Methodist Church, and we are mandated by the Book of Discipline, which is not necessarily the case for all areas of work um, across the agency. Um, U.S. disaster response has um, a few sections within the Book of Discipline that are our obligations to the Methodist conferences. And then there are also areas of responsibility for those annual conferences as it relates to disaster response and recovery. Um, so we, we're very lucky that we have the Book of Discipline to lead um, and set the vision for the work that we do as a team. And speaking of team, um, I'm going to ask y'all a question real quick. Thinking about the United States and disaster response, how many folks do y'all think? are on the USDR team. It's my favorite pop quiz. There are no wrong answers, I promise. Less than five. Less than five. Well, apparently there are right answers. <laughs> you're, you're right there, you're close there. Thank God it's not just me. <laughs> <laughs> None of us would want that, I promise. You go to the next slide for the We are across all 50 states and the U.S. territories. And so with geography like this, 
and scope and scale of programming that covers our entire country. Sometimes when I ask that question, it's like 25, 15, 300. We're like, okay, not quite, not quite, but close to what was said. We are a team of three staff, including myself. So I'm a director, I get to be, you know, a shepherd for this programming. And then I have a program manager, Greg Ellis, that helps work with the annual conferences and um, supporting them in program development, design, um, grants. And then I have a training manager who really leads the capacity building efforts that we have across all of the disaster response and recovery work that we do. I am very lucky that I have a team of consultants who are technical experts in their areas of work. Um, they also, at least two of them, were conference disaster response coordinators before they became consultants in our team. And both my program manager and training manager have been conference disaster response coordinators in their conferences as well, Eastern Pennsylvania and Tennessee, Western Kentucky. So we are a small but hardy group that um, work virtually, in person, um, building capacity and empowering equipping United Methodist conferences to live into those responsibilities and areas of work that the Book of Discipline describes and lists out. Um, Brittany, go to the next one for me. So I'm gonna go a little old school this morning. Hopefully y'all uh, bear with me. I don't usually go for King James Version of scripture, but this particular verse, uh, two verses I actually memorized when I was a kid. And the King James Version is what I memorized. So that's the version that I'm most comfortable with, but I invite y'all to work with whatever um, version of scripture best suits your, your needs and understanding. Um, but in Romans 12, which if y'all have not read Romans, it is just such amazing scripture. Um, there are, are words and mandates and promises and work that is written throughout this book. But chapter 12, verses one through two, I beseech you therefore, brethren, in view of God's mercies, present yourselves a living sacrifice, which is holy and acceptable unto God, that is reasonable service. But be ye not conformed to the patterns of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Often in disasters, particularly um, large-scale disasters, and we've been having those thanks to climate change more frequently and on grander scales than we have in prior years. Every year we are out pacing ourselves in the number of disasters that we respond to. In 2021, U.S. disaster response responded to 48 unique disasters. Um, that is not including the wildfires that consolidate and become one mega fire. So you can imagine that we have technically more disasters that we responded to over last year. And in that space of chaos and darkness, um, sometimes literal darkness, it often feels, and it is appropriate to ask about what God's will is. When we are in the depths of a challenge of extreme loss of pain. I come to this verse, these two verses, again and again in my own life, because God invites us 
to not only trust God's will, but to prove it. And for me, coming from an Emory University science background, what happens when we're seeking to prove something? We're testing it. We're not testing it once. We're testing it twice. We're testing it as many times as it takes for trust to develop. Maybe that's a vaccine and knowing how a vaccine will affect our health as we're still in a global pandemic. Maybe it's understanding if we provide shelter to folks, they're more than likely to adhere to a medical regimen and adhere to doctor's protocols of treatment. There are lots and lots of arenas across our work in U.S. disaster response, but also across the work of UNCOR and every general agency where we have to prove. We have to test and prove the will of God for our lives and our work. And for us, in thinking about transformation, transformation in U.S. disaster response is at the same time both personal and individual and community-based. So we are working in U.S. disaster response, particularly through our early response team program, which is where volunteers are trained and deployed in the early days, weeks, and months after a disaster strikes to be in service to our hurting neighbors. But then as we move forward in disaster response, we're moving towards something called long-term recovery, which is that very intentional work of helping survivors and leaders in a community identify and cast a vision for what they wish their community to look like, feel like, and be when they're past the impacts of the immediate impacts of a disaster. And it is absolutely normal and appropriate for those questions to come up in those times of, why did this happen to me? Why my house and not my neighbor's house? Which is very, very common with disasters like tornadoes, like the December tornadoes that impacted Kentucky, Arkansas, Missouri, and other states. Hurricane Ida went from Louisiana across the Southeast and all up the East Coast, up to the Northeast. It's very easy and appropriate to ask what the heck is going on here? Why has this happened? Sometimes we can answer those questions scientifically, but more often than not, it is a test. We don't understand. I can't provide that understanding, the team can, but what we can do is walk through those emotions, that grief, that sadness, the loss and help survivors understand at least that piece and receive the tools and the resources needed to find hope in the middle of that great challenging time. And that transformation really is from darkness to light, from challenge to normal whatever normal is, right? I don't even know if that is a word that we're allowed to use anymore because I'm not sure that it has a significant meaning. But whatever the survivor and the communities identify as what they need and where they want to go is where we go to. I've always said, this is just the point of privilege since I'm here. I've always said as a kid, and even moving into being a young adult and now 
Yeah, I've arrived. I'm 40 now. <laughs> um, there are friends who, when the darkness comes, won't arrive. When it gets really hard, there are people who will text you and say, I'm pregnant for you, but they won't come over. There is a calling. When we're asking and thinking about and we're challenged with building a beloved community to listen, to learn, but to go into the darkness. I want to be the person that when you are down in a hole and you can't see the light, I'm climbing in. USDR, UMCOR, GDGM, we climb in. And we will sit in the dark as long as it takes for us to journey together back out. But it's not what we need. It's not what we envision. It's not our transformation, even though I can promise you every single one of us that works in disaster response and recovery has our own transformation story. I know I do. You can't work in this space and be in community and connection with folks that are hurting and not be changed by it. Transformation is, is the name of the game. But it's not us, it's survivors, it's communities, it's the Methodist Church. Yes, ma'am. Um, sure, whatever you would like to, this is your time. Two very, very good questions. And for the folks online, I'm going to repeat them. You've got, you've got it. You're going to type it in front. Okay. So the first question is around partnering, um, which is really, I would say, the foundation of what and how Encore works. Um, and it works differently in different areas within um, Encore for us within U.S. Disaster Response. We're mandated by the Book of Discipline to partner with the U.S. United Methodist Conferences. So that's our primary partnership is with the conferences and the local church. That is really different in other areas of work internationally. Um, they partner with many more nonprofits than U.S. Disaster Response does. Um, but we also are a national member of something called NVOAD, which is National Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster. And so NVOAD is the primary coordination body for disaster response in the United States. We, along with every major nonprofit, and the majority of us are ecumenical, we work together in that space from a technical perspective. So in the sectors that we work in, in terms of recovery programming, but also from a partnership, a planning, um, a design perspective. And that leads to that aspect of not duplicating efforts. Each partner, each organization, and each conference in the Methodist Church has their own capacities and areas of interest in which they work in disaster response and recovery. And so it's very soon after a disaster strikes that a long-term recovery group becomes established. And that is a local coordination body 
where community members, nonprofits, UMCOR, Methodist agencies all come together to have those conversations, to be in discernment with each other over what survivors, what communities are saying they need and how we will collectively move forward as a disaster response and recovery community. Um, we, as U.S. Disaster Response, our primary funding goes to the Methodist churches, so to the annual conference. Um, but there's a variety of ways that UMCOR and GBGM partners outside of just the U.S. Disaster Response space. Um, local churches, annual conferences, nonprofits, but ecumenical partners are um, a really important aspect of how we do that work. Um, for UMCOR in USDR, we are, we're gonna get to that a little bit in a second, but the way that we work with the Methodist Church means that we are training and equipping local folks and communities to respond locally. So each in like the early response team program that I was mentioning, we are training and background checking each every single individual that goes through our ERT basic program. Um, and that is a nationally recognized program by FEMA and others for those chaotic times. Those folks are trusted to be able to enter semi-dangerous situations that are post-disaster where there's still debris, power lines are down. Things are, are very, very complex in those times. And these folks are trained and the conference, their coordinator deploys those teams and folks deploy to other conferences based on invitation. So the way that we work is local to national and national to local. It's a very symbiotic relationship where we're together in those times. And we stay and we journey. We tend to say it's sort of a, a catchphrase that UMCOR is early in and last out. We, we don't desire to be there within five minutes because we want to take that responsibility for community safety and volunteer safety seriously. So there is that time where folks are on the ground, making sure they're assessing damage, understanding who's doing what and where. That could be a day after a disaster strikes. It could be a week to two weeks after a disaster strikes. But we are in that work and that space together. Yes, sir. Sure. So what happens in the funding structure that exists, we have something called advances. And advances are funds, sort of like accounts, that have been set up for specific purposes. So for Ukraine, as the example, there are two advances that are currently being utilized. And knowing that this is not USDR, so if I misspeak, it's because that's not my portfolio. But international disaster response is working and responding with partners through the Methodist Church in Europe and, and there in Ukraine, through nonprofits that are already 
actually on the ground in Ukraine and have been for survivors that are not able to leave the country. Global migration is the other advance that is supporting folks that are refugees that are displaced into the region. And so through those two advances, those leaders, my, my colleagues that are also directors of, of those departments are able to work with those organizations to identify what the survivors and community needs are to create a plan and design projects. And so those grants are initiated and funded with the understanding that there are certain objectives that need to be met during whatever time period they've agreed to. And so those are the basic components of any grant agreement that's issued by GBGM and UMCOR. Um, as far as what the donors are, are specifying, um, usually donations come in and they're specified for a particular response, not necessarily particular activities. And so we would, again, want to be listening to community, the folks that are impacted by the war, the folks that are working with those communities and identifying needs and building funding around meeting those needs as they're identified by those affected. So that's sort of how it works out. I can't get too, more, too, too much more in detail because um, then I'll start to misspeak and, and get myself into hot water. But I can give you the examples for the US side of how we work and it might mirror some of the ways that internationally they're also having those conversations. Um, Hurricane Ida, Louisiana all the way up. We've been working, I'll just give New Jersey as an example, with the Greater New Jersey Conference since honestly before the, the storm hit. Um, I was on the phone and working with their coordinator and their communities days leading up to the storm coming up to New Jersey. And we've been working every day together since to respond locally, give them the resources that they need to be equipped. Um, we've issued solidarity grants, which are, are very, um, it's a very fast mechanism of small funding that provides that initial support that volunteers and the teams need to get um, the response going. And then we stay in conversation and we provide supplies and we identify and work on a project design for the next four to five years of work. Understanding that we're in year one, year one and our understanding of what's needed may be different than year three, but that is what that journey is about. It's about staying in community connection with each other and working in lockstep with each other. The Greater New Jersey team identified disaster case management, which is a recovery function where case managers work one-on-one -on -one with survivors to identify their personal needs, their household needs, and then match resources that are available to those survivors, to those homes. It could be a roof, it could be a couch, it could be an appliance, it could be a car, it could be clothes. But it's, again, listening and supporting and also holding space for the emotions that those survivors feel as they're moving through that process of moving towards recovery. And that can look different, again, with each survivor, each case manager, each conference, construction management comes in with repairs and rebuilds, also volunteer management when volunteers come in through UMVIM and through other avenues with local churches wanting to get involved in that work. And so we really stay in connection and we journey together for years. We're just wrapping up their Hurricane Maria programming in Puerto Rico. 
Have y'all heard Puerto Rico on the news lately for anything? No, but we've still been there. That's what that last out is. We might not be the first there because we're not looking for cameras. We're not looking for pictures to be on the news. But we will be there when survivors meet us. And we will stay until they don't. That's a commitment. That's why this is a ministry and not a program. It's why we as individuals do this as Methodists. Because this is our calling. It is not easy work. It is not. I'm getting myself a little choked up because when I tend to talk about this, I tend to get a little emotional because it's people. It's names that I know. It's places that I've been. I was just in Kentucky earlier in the year, a few months ago. It's, it's churches that fell to the ground. Those are baptisms. Those are communions. Those are places that people have passed and their funeral was there. They were born to that community. And that is really, really important to us to help folks get that back. And so whether it's the pandemic or the war in Ukraine, or Hurricane Ida, Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Maria, 48 disasters last year. Um, we are part of the journey and part of the family that is woven into the tapestry of these communities for the long haul. I'm going to press pause and get us to the next slide. Because I really want to give y'all the names of the people who I just spent Friday at annual conference with. I love these two people. We've got Scott Parrish and Tom Shores, who are co-conference disaster response coordinators in the North Georgia annual conference. These two gentlemen lead the disaster ministry work here in North Georgia. Noonan, Tornado, I met the entire team that has been working on long-term recovery at Noonan on Friday. These folks have been quietly being that calm Christian presence in Noonan not asking for anything, they're volunteers, but they're part of that early response team program. And then they continue to work with repair and rebuilds and are still working with survivors on their homes and will remain there because you know what? They live there, that's their home. And so, I just want to provide those opportunities. These are the two um, early response team and then Connecting Neighbors. Connecting Neighbors is a USDR program that helps local churches become better prepared for disasters. We say it's about ready churches, ready congregates, so personal preparedness, and ready communities. I kind of wish that we had been throwing connecting neighbors like everywhere before 2020. So maybe we could have helped a little bit more, but connecting neighbors allows us to be intimately engaged with preparedness efforts. The more that we are prepared for the thing that we can't anticipate as churches, as communities, as United Methodists, the more efficient and effective response and recovery efforts are. FEMA says that for every $1 that is spent on preparedness efforts, we save $5 in early response programming. 
for every one dollar that's spent in preparedness, we save seven to eleven daughters dollars in long term recovery efforts. So if you would like to be involved in this work. I'm happy to help get y'all connected, especially y'all online. Um, but also Scott Parrish and Tom Shores are the two gentlemen that this is their calling and their ministry here within our conference. And I'm blessed to call them friends and blessed to be a member of the North Georgia Conference myself. We're gonna move just, I think there's one last slide that's also a video. I promise it's much shorter than the first one, um, but just a little wrap up before we go more questions and, and um, opportunities. Humanitarian relief and recovery is at the core of global ministries work. The United Methodist Committee on Relief was founded more than 80 years ago in response to the devastation caused by the Second World War. Today, our efforts to alleviate human suffering include disaster response, support of refugees and migrants, and efforts to increase environmental sustainability and decrease food insecurity. This work is collaborative work involving the church, partners, volunteers, caseworkers, and counselors ready to serve all in need regardless of nationality or race, faith or status. I thought it was really important to put some of those faces and names, which I won't say, but uh, to connect the realities of this work, whether it's U.S. disaster response, or it's international, or it's global migration, or it's environmental sustainability. We are all part of the body of Christ. And if one person or one community hurts, we're all hurting. It's not easy work, but it's the best work I've ever been a part of. And I just invite y'all to join us. If it's not with U.S. disaster response, there are so many other ways to get plugged in and to be part of this ministry. Um, and I know that I'm the one here right now, but there are 54 people that work across the United States on behalf of their conference to repair, respond, and to support recovery from disasters in our country. Those are the people that are the hands and heart of God in this world for U.S. disaster response. And those are the people that I just want to lift up. Because when we say, be there, be hope, we actually really need it. And it's people like y'all and people like them that bring hope to a hurting world. And that's really meaningful to me and I hope to you all as well. Y'all, I talked way too much. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, but if there are other questions or, or anything online, Brent, I mean, Happy, happy to talk more about those. Yes, sir. What, what does it look like for someone who wants to volunteer for the services that we can give? But yes, for those who want to get their hands dirty. Yes. What's that, what's that opportunity for disaster response? Absolutely. So for, for us, that early response team program is the primary way that we have for folks to get involved um, in disaster response. So um, it, the first piece is what we call ERT basic training. It is um, a hands-on training where we learn together about how to work with survivors and traumatized communities. 
how we listen to folks who are sharing their grief and their heartbreak, but also how do we tarp a roof? How do we get on a ladder safely? Um, how do we uh, build kits? We have a, a supplies ministry that um, or, um, helps coordinate. And we have um, warehouses across the United States. So there is a warehouse here in North Georgia. So whether it's cleaning kits or hygiene kits, um, there are opportunities for anybody to do kit drives and to help build some of those supplies that literally move across the United States every single day in response to different disaster types. Um, and then um them. There are tremendous opportunities that um for USDR partners with um them to provide in long-term recovery. These can be rebuild teams, it can be emotional and spiritual care and providing um, disaster chaplaincy to both the communities that are hurting and the teams that are providing that support um, because everybody needs emotional and spiritual care during those times of hard work. Um, so different projects, specific projects are listed on the on them website that you can sign up for. They also do international work on them does and they coordinate teams that travel and can be in service. For us, it really is get connected with your conference disaster response coordinator because the trainings are here locally. We're trying to plan. I was giving, you know, maybe some encouragement to get some ERT basic trainings going here in the next month to two months. Maybe Scott Parrish is watching right now. Um, and signing up for those and getting engaged through that process will really help get you almost immediately on the ground this summer, I can promise. Uh, hurricane season just started June 1st. We have tropical storm Alex that has just formed up um, in Florida, just in the Gulf. We need you and we can really get folks connected whether it's here in North Georgia or it's going to Florida or Alabama or Louisiana um, to help those conferences and those really challenging times. I'm happy to get you connected. <laughs> and anybody online too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah please. My email is lmartin at umcore.org. And I am happy, happy, happy to be a connector for folks that want to get engaged. And I think I saw your hand up. Yes, ma'am. Oh, a question about structure. Yes, ma'am. Who would not be critical to that moving? Yes, ma'am. Now, in order to have that uh, working on practice level, there would need to be somebody coordinating. Yes, ma'am. So how does that work out? I'm going to say a name. I said I was going to say names, but now I am because I'm going to sing his praises. Scott Parrish and Mr. Bill Pound. Bill Pound is an early response team member and leader, and I believe he's a trainer. But he has been the local coordinator for so many of those efforts. I had a distinct pleasure to finally meet him in person on Friday in Athens. And it is really through that training and then his experience of deployment that he was able to bring his skills and his leadership to his own community. And he continues to be an important point of coordination and leadership for us to this day. And we have folks like Bill in every single conference. We have over 6,000 early response team members across the United States. We are training all day, every day, volunteers to be engaged in this work. Because you never know when the next disaster is going to happen, but we can guarantee that it would. It's just a matter of time. 
part of this magic inspiration and directly with the chant. Yes, he does. Oh, yes. Scott Parrish got a call about 5.30 a.m. At 5.35 a.m., I'm pretty sure he called Bill Powell. <laughs> and then I got a call after that. I am not important in those times. And let me just tell y'all, I don't consider myself really important at all. It is people like Bill that are on the grounds that are called into this ministry and this work, and I get to resource them. That is everything to me. Um, and we really are. We, we just have tremendous folks that are dedicated to this work and have continued throughout all of the challenges of the past two and a half years, still working with a four survivors. It's incredible. I don't know if I answered the question appropriately, but <laughs> um, it's, it's really a blessing. It's, and that's sort of the mentality and the way that, that we work um, across US disaster response and also international disaster response. They have internationally um, disaster management offices in which they have trained personnel, volunteers more often than not, um, but also folks that get financially supported to be able to do this work internationally as well. It's really incredible. Any other questions coming up? Well, I just want to thank y'all for inviting me and allowing me to be part of this series to help kick it off for you here this summer. Um, it's a real pleasure, and I'm just so grateful that it worked out that I could join you today. So thank y'all so much. Thank you for, for being here and being a part of it and getting us started. Um, yeah, we were, for those who don't know, um, I got Laura's name through Reverend Jenny Phillips, who um, in her family are active parts of this congregation, and she um, works for UMCOR as part of their environmental stewardship um, area. And so you know, we've got connections all around. So um, I hope now when you hear us talk about UMCOR, you'll know a little bit more about what it is we're giving to and how they're on the ground getting good work done in response to disasters. Um, do hope you'll be with us next week. Um, Dr. Avis Williams is going to be here. Um, Dr. Williams is going to speak on uh, her role in the Emory Twin Memorials Project. Um, for those who don't know, Emory has been doing work both here and at Oxford um, in um, the history uh, and the work of enslaved persons in the building of Emory and Oxford and Emory at Oxford. Um, and so they're looking at memorials on both campuses um, to recognize that and to bring that history to life. And so um, I'm really excited. Uh, we've been come up trying to get um, Dr. Williams and others in that project to come for a while now. And so uh, she'll be with us um, next Sunday. Uh, we'll have a Zoom option. We'll be here in person and just we'll keep rolling. But uh, thank you so much for being here. Hope everyone has a great week and we'll see you soon. All right, bye.